Okay, so here's what we're gonna do in this video. Today, we're gonna go through two interviews that I had, just certain sections of it, uh, one with Dr. Irving Finkel and the other with Dr. John Walton. And uh, then I'm gonna insert a third video which is from Dr. Michael Heiser's YouTube channel uh, and we're gonna go over and compare all three of what they have to say about the relationship between the Genesis flood story and the flood story from ancient Mesopotamia. So, uh, we're gonna kick it right off, go straight into one with Dr. Finkel. Um, I'm gonna pause it at certain points, because I'm, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, you know, some claims they make, some assertions they make within each of these interviews, and we're gonna just compare those to each other at the end and see where they, where they actually disagree with each other and where the tension is, and then we wanna try to make that tension go away, all right? so. Let's get started here. Story uh, is from its own oral tradition, and he had a few reasons why. One of them being that um, it is rather short. If you were to convey it over back up into Akkadian or something, it would be a fairly short story. And his argument was that it that would mean that it wasn't really expounded upon like what we would think if it was pulled from this so much older of a tradition from the Mesopotamians. What do you, are you just thoughts on that, or is that just hogwash? Well, the way I look at it, um, point one is that the flood story in Mesopotamia is part of a long literary narrative with build up and tension and the, the, the difficulties under which the, the Atrahasis operated. And then uh, the whole thing is a long, long narrative. And the thing in the Bible is a digest of it where they take out of it the essential points. And the reason that, that I say that is, it seems to me that, that um, in the Mesopotamian tradition, the... Okay, I'm going to pause right there, make our first point here. So, what we have here is Dr. Irving Finkel says, the tradition... In the Bible is a digest that takes the essential points. Okay, so Well, obviously, of the Mesopotamians. All right. So, that's the first point. So, we're going to go on. Gods had decided that the human beings were tiresome and irritating, and they were going to obliterate them and replace them with something. But um, the flood was only one of the things to which they exposed them. It was the last one. And when when um, there was fire and starvation and I don't know what, and th this was the last one, and um, because of the Mesopotamian dependence on water and the vulnerability of them to interference with water, the story ends up that they weren't destroyed and there is a rainbow in the Babylonian tradition, like in the Bible. So you have a whole long thing. Now, when the early part of the book of Genesis was written, the whole point of it was to explain quickly and intelligibly about the beginning of the world and what happened in all those, Adam and Eve and the flood and the patriarchs and all that, squeezed into a simple, straightforward narrative in order to show that God was all-powerful and really very unforgiving and very, very harsh but again, didn't allow the world. So they took the Babylonian motif, I believe, and used it for their own principle. But where is the flood in the ba Babylonian world was to shut the noise up, which annoyed the gods. In the Judaic philosophical view, the thing it combated was sin. Okay, so here's our next point here. And that's that. Bible, we're just going to start doing it that way. Takes 
the Babylonian motif and uses it for its own theological okay but I started uh, I guess to be fair I don't want to say theological because he doesn't say theological in reality I, sh I should just say philosophical principles all right Pens going out here. All right. So on to the next. It was a moral question, and they took the the program notes, so to speak, and told the story in a very apocopated way, which is very punchy and very effective without all the padding. Mm. So it seems to me it's no, there's no question that the second is derived from the first, and also you know the oldest evidence is at least a thousand years before any biblical mm -hmm. text was ever written down, and also this that there's never been a flood in Jerusalem, there's never been a flood in Jerusalem, whereas in Mesopotamia there are floods all the time, big and little, and must once in a while been really disastrous things. So I think that's the relationship between them. Mm -hmm. it's a digest as you might say and so much of genesis i feel like one through 11 is just polemic against you know I, i'm imagine what i uh dr michael heiser was a i took a class on old testament under him and he uh talked about uh it's it's uh, you imagine the israelite captives in babylon and they're sitting there and the way he kind of explained it was so oh, you have these guys sitting around the river and you're hearing all these babylonians being like oh yeah how's that how how good's your god now and then instead so you have the israelite scribes take their stories and write polemics against them kind of giving yahweh the credit that all their gods had for all the things that you know they have in there but that's that's the way that he kind of uh, it broke that down to in short terms but I just, I mean, me personally, I definitely don't see how someone would, I mean, there's just too many things that correlate from the Mesopotamian tradition, the biblical tradition, like, sure, they could all be talking about some ancient flood, but it definitely was, they're, they're pulling these stories. I mean, you, you don't have uh, putting the bird out. I mean, uh, yeah, that's uh, quite uh, serious. That's I mean, quite that's, serious. it's, that, that, that's such a small thing that there's no way they're just pulled. Both of them are pulling that out of their hat. I just, I, I refuse to believe that. But there's also a slightly more compelling point about the relationship you've just been talking about, is that in the description of the flood and the ark in Hebrew, there are um, several words which don't otherwise exist in Hebrew, and they are borrowed from Babylonian. So the words came with the story, mm -hmm. loan words, that's quite punchy, I think, oh. or evidence. Mm -hmm. um, well, have you, have you read the... Okay. So, um, that's fine. Let's go with that one. Um, well, actually, it's not Babylonian loan words. These are Akkadian. Akkadian. Did I spell that right? Is it two Ds? I never remember. It's either two Ks or two Ds. Um, Akkadian loan words came with the story boof all right start before no mm -hmm. yes sir yeah. but audiobook i'm an audiobook person i listen while i work and stuff but i've well, listened I, I, to that I, that one's I, awesome i never dared listen to that thing i mean i went and recorded it took a week after work three hours of the go i never dared listen to it i couldn't stand oh, it, it was so amazing i, I love what, it though. What's important is that the, the, the difference between Chinese whispers and two guys sitting on a river and one say, what does your God do? And you say, that's all very well and good. But when you have literary dependence, such as you have between the two batches of texts, that doesn't wash. And, and, and my argument was that the bit when they taught the intelligent Judeans to read and write, under Nebuchadnezzar, they taught them cuneiform, and that's that's that. That's how they had access. Okay, so really, there's two here. Um, the first one is going to be that uh, 
uh, polemic. What's the right way to word it? So what he said was, um, you know, it doesn't wash. It doesn't. It doesn't work that uh, you can have a polemic because there's literary dependency, right? He's saying that you can't really have them doing that. Well, your God did this, my God did that, yada, yada, because literary dependency. So I'm gonna put, because that's called a polemic. Polemic is negated by literary dependency. I guess I just have horrible handwriting. I don't know. That doesn't feel right. It's late. If I misspell something on a note, who cares? Judge me all you would like. All right. And the other one, what did he just say? He just said, oh, they had access. That's the other one. They had access to Okay, we're gonna do that again. This part's not going good. We're getting in a hurry here. To Acadian when they were taught it in Babylon. All right. Under Nebuchadnezzar, they taught in cuneiform. And that's that's that. That's how they had access, and that's how they learned the text. They they were taught how to read and write Babylonian because they wanted to make them Babylonians, so they didn't ferment rebellion. These refugees, so they took the cream of the youth, and for, for, for um, six years they were taught um, how to read cuneiform. So they had the access to this literature by it, by virtue of being able to read it. So when, the, the, in my opinion, the, the Bible was written to explain how it was that the ch chosen people who were on such good terms with their own special God and everything was going fine, ended up in such a mess that Jerusalem was sacked, the temple was destroyed, and they were all penniless refugees in an alien country. And what that what the, the biblical text is, is to explain how that can be. I mean, that, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's all a justification of everything. So, I, I, I don't know. But, I mean, th this is a complex matter. When, when the um, art came out, there were some trenchant reviews, especially from the southern states of America, where people suggested that I should be targeted for undermining the divine word of the Lord and things of that kind. Oh, but, I um, can imagine. <laughs> Yeah, so you get toughened up, but nobody's actually um, turned up to lecture with a crossbow or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think... Okay. So now, uh, this is my latest interview with Dr. John Walton. And um, we're going to... I'm going to explain kind of the situation of me going over with Dr. Finkel. Boop. John... Whoops, Walton. Let's go ahead and put a doctor in there too. Loop. And then one more green line just for orderliness. Back to black. All right. So, uh, gonna go over some of the points he has too. Uh, he talked about how, and maybe you can just give some pushback on this that, you know, the biblical writers are directly copying. The flood story because of Akkadian loan words. That's what he, the stance he takes on that. And I know, uh, I mean, Michael Jones has gone over that as well on his channel and stuff like that. But, uh, and you do it in the book as well. But wh why do you, what is the pushback against that when it feels like if they're just pulling these words, if they're Akkadian words, what, what is, why does that not mean they're copying? What are the other options there? The use of Akkadian loan words mm -hmm. can indicate their awareness of those texts. And if they want to use some of the concepts of. Okay. Just want to um, put that one down because that's going to be important later when we go over really where the, where the, where the issue is here. All right. Akkadian loan 
words can mean there. There's an E in there, I promise. Aware of the text. Beep. Boop. Boop. There we go. That those texts by using those words that presumably their audience would have understood, that's fine. That doesn't mean that they're copying. Mm -hmm. They are in conversation. There's a common event that people in Mesopotamia understand, people in the Israel understand a common event, and they both want to talk about it. And there's good reason why they both want to talk about it. The idea of does do the Israelites only know of accounts of that event from Mesopotamian texts? Even if they do, I don't care. The, mm. the issue is not how at, at what level or on what basis they share information about the event. The texts are there not to describe an event, but to explain an event. That's a good one right there. The texts are there not to describe an event, but to explain the event. Wonderful. Why it happened, what it was for, no matter how big it was, no matter whether the Israelites only found out about it when they were in Babylon, I, I don't care. Um, the fact is, the Bible gives a very different interpretation of the event. And that's that's what the inspiration is all about. That mm -hmm. is, the narrator is inspired to interpret events. Mm -hmm. And it's the interpretation of the event that is nothing at all like what we have in the Gilgamesh epic. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I don't care where they got information about the event. I don't care if it was an angel whispering in their ear or if it was because Noah had passed it down through the lines and Abraham knew about it or whether they learned about it just from their awareness of the cultural discourse with Babylonians. I don't care. Mm -hmm. What's inspired, what's authoritative about the text is the interpretation of the event, what the narrator does with it. And you can't in any way claim that he's copying that from the Babylonians. Wonderful. What's inspired is the interpretation of the event. And that is in no way copied. Okay, and I get I'm putting it in quotes and they're not like exactly saying this, but just that that's the point, right? This isn't like I'm not quoting them and like you just I just played it for you, right? Mm -hmm. That's precisely what's different. Mm -hmm. It's just even that be, was oh, sorry. Even before the Babylonian exile, there is significant cultural discourse going on, exchange of ideas, cross fertilization. Israelites would have known the primary literature of Babylon because their scribes would have been trained in it, even though they were Israelite scribes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that literature would have been available to them. So we don't need to think even that, oh, this is because they were in Babylon for the exile. Well, that might have been important at one level, but it's it's not like first time. I never heard of this stuff before. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, another uh, I don't even really need to quote that, but that's just kind of important to point out, right? So, like, um, we have, we know that, like, cultures were intermingling and trading, I mean, way far back, 2500 BC. I mean, we have people trading vast distances, I mean, from the Indus Valley all the way to Mesopotamia. So, when we want to say that, like, the Israelites, right, had no idea what was going on 
uh, under the Akkadian Empire or any of these places. That's probably not true, right? You know, these these places, I mean, we're saying that we already had trade and discourse and things going on between nations in 2500 BC. And it actually didn't go even further back than that, but I'm comfy saying that. Um, 2500 BC, we're talking about right now, I mean, the flood story is 1600, 1200. I mean, sure. Uh, like he said, it's it's probably really important that they were in Babylon, but in no way does that like. It's just probably not the first time they ever heard the story, right? So, anyways, and do we have any reason to think that um, well, David being, you know, a thousand BC or so, but that the Israelites at some point would have been using Akkadian as like the lingua franca, just like everywhere else no. was, like the Egyptians. We don't have any There's reason. No reason to no reason to think they would have been using it, but that doesn't mean that their scribes wouldn't have been trained in it. We mm -hmm. know very little about the Israelite scribal schools. Okay, but uh, again, there's a fragment of Gilgamesh epic that was found at Megiddo uh, from 11th century before David, therefore, which suggests that they that could, stuff's being yeah. used. They could have very well known about it already. Yeah. Okay. Now... Um, doctor. Michael Heiser. Now, as I said, pulled this from Dr. Heiser's YouTube video. Not mine. But we're going to go through it too. And then we're going to go through where the actual pushback is. And if there's an easy way to just kind of throw that away, right? So let's go. They're, they're going to make they're going to make their own assumptions about that. Now I want I want to show you something. Her her comment was that that a, a culture is going to make certain assumptions about what common knowledge is. Like if you're writing a flood story, there's going to be elements in there that everybody should just know. I mean, there's going to be some unique elements in there too, and that would take us back to okay, if you're using the the raven thing. You know, that's probably not like in everybody's story. Water's probably in everybody's story. <laughs> you know, but the raven thing is a little too narrow. And so you had to be looking at that. You had to have some reason that that was useful to you. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to the usefulness and reasonable. I want to show you something. I did not have you. Okay, so right off the bat. Raven thing. Not in everybody's story. All right. Now, what does he mean here? Um, you know, so you have like flood stories in other cultures, right? But you don't have the raven thing going on. So, what he's saying here is like, uh, you can you can assume literary dependency between two two stories when you have things that are like by no means necessary for that type of story in both stories and you have well more than one thing i mean you have multiple multiple things going on between these two flood stories so anyways continuing to read this and i'm going to i'm going to show you two things i think tonight and um i've given both of these to john and we'll put these online but this is from a it's from a book here from babylon to baghdad ancient iraq and the modern west and the, the first or the second, well, first article, but the second item here, The Genesis of Genesis by Victor Hurwitz. Hurwitz is a cuneiform guy and a biblical studies guy. This is from, uh, it's either Biblical Archaeology Review put this out or the Biblical Archaeological Society. So he is the creation story of Babylonian. So he's going through all this stuff. And, you know, there's our, our buddy George Smith. You know, we can lay all, all the blame at his feet, you know, for a lot of this stuff. And then Dalich is going to come into the picture. But he goes through the, the different story elements. And then he gets to Lambert. There's Lambert's article. All told, Lambert sees the connections between Genesis 1 and Enuma Elish as relatively few in number. Again, you read the article, so that, that shouldn't be news to you. But he, he also notes something else. Many of the parallels between the Babylonian poem and the Bible are as common throughout Near Eastern literature as to be insignificant. 
There you go. That's the point. Common knowledge. There, that, that's a legitimate thing even back here. As recent scholarship is making clear, simplistic comparison between Enuma Elish and the biblical tra tradition as if the Bible were directly dependent on Enuma Elish and it alone is patently untenable. In other words, it's nonsense. And yet there's clearly some kind of relationship. Then he talks a little bit about Dalich and Smith and he has this observation. He starts looking at, well, let's compare Mesopotamian stuff to other Mesopotamian stuff. The author of Enuma Elish is deliberately attributing to Marduk and Babylon acts ascribed to other gods and cities in other myths about the same subject. The author is stealing the thunder of these gods, undermining them in favor of Marduk. So what he described is Hurwitz makes the point that, you know, if you compare just the Mesopotamian stuff, here you have an old text and the hero God is, you know, Anlil. But if you go into, into Babylon, the Babylonian period, which is later, 6th century BC, all of a sudden it's Marduk. And, and the Marduk story looks a lot like this older one. So it isn't just those two, it's more than two. As you acquire and translate more flood stories, or not flood stories, but well, flood or creation, whatever it is here. His article's wider than just the creation stuff this week. You begin to notice that the real agenda here is not, we're so dumb we can't come up with a story. I'm so glad we have a library so I have something to write now. I'm going to steal this guy blind and put my name on it. That is not the agenda. The agenda is to use the material theologically. So what the biblical guy is doing is pretty much the same as what everybody else is doing. But no, no one is thinking that one is dependent on the other because they don't have something to write. It's all about religious and theological messaging. Okay, so a quote that it feels like we've heard a lot. It's all about... Okay, so Dr. Finkel said that as well. So what's going on here? Now, having said that, again, it reflects a political theological competition over primacy. So if we say that, I wanna to go to the key question here. Well, do I even have it at the end? I'm just gonna give it to you because I don't know if I have it at the end exactly. Here's the question. And I hope you get the point right away. If I'm a, a Hebrew, an Israelite, a biblical writer, and I want to write a creation story, and I want to give credit to Yahweh as the creator, both for my audience and also as sort of a smackdown to our theological and religious competitors, how can I possibly do that without borrowing. Think about that. How would you do it? You, there's no way you can do it without dipping into the material. It would be like me assigning you, let's say, you know, you're all the same church. And I said, I want you all to write a paper, you know, on why, you know, our worship service is better than the, the church down the street there but you're not allowed to tell me anything that the other place does. Like, how am I supposed to do that? I've got to be able to dip in to what they do and say to make the comparison. All right. Have to be able to dip into what they say 
to make the comparison. That's the point. It's not that, again, the biblical writers' heads were so empty and the Israelites alone are so stupid that they can't write anything down. The point is, because they have the agenda they do, they must do something with the other material. Sometimes it'll be a thought, put that in my own words. Sometimes it'll be a specific word or phrase or an item because they want their readers to hook mentally back into the thing that they are comparing to. If they can't use the material, there's no way to do it. It's just not possible. Now, if, if you're thinking that, that reframes entirely the whole relationship between biblical material and the comparative material. And this happens not only with Bible and Babylon, it happens within Babylon, competing city-states. People are used to doing this. This is how you do theology. This is how you do polemic. Actually, it's good. You must dip into the other material or else you got nothing. You got nothing to say. You got nothing to work with. So it's not one's intellectually up here and the other ones are like the three stooges. Okay, no, no, there, there are no stooges in this picture. Okay, so those are those three videos, right? I need to go ahead and write down this last one. So... You must dip in to do a polemic. And also, as he said, Babylon and all of them were doing this to each other as well. So, this was common practice and to be expected. It was how you do theology, right? Like I said, how you do theology. So, what, 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 what's the point of tension here then even, right? Because it sounds like they all said the same thing. I know exactly what the point of tension is, and I'm going to go right to it. Okay. It's this right here. Right? That's the only point that the Christian scholars and Dr. Finkel disagree. But if you think about this, right? And I love Dr. Finkel, and he's a genius, and he's awesome. But this right here seems a little illogical to me. Because a polemic, in and of itself... Okay, let's just actually... Bring up... Oxford Dictionary. Okay. Yet to da. Just gotta add a scene real fast. All right. Here. Boop. I'm back. Above that one, though. All right. The definition of polemic. Right. 
right here. A speech or writing expressing a strongly critical attack or controversial opinion about someone or something. It's polemic about the cultural relativism, 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 jeez, I shouldn't be doing this at 1030 at night, um, of the 60s. So, a polemic, right, kind of necessitates using other material. So, if that's the case, I mean, I think the only thing that any of these guys disagree on, everyone seems to agree with each other. Um, biblical scholars don't think that they aren't pulling from this. It's just that they don't view it as copying, and they view it as doing the same thing that all these other cultures are doing. So I think that um, all that I can really say here is that perhaps um, I could have worded it in a different way and Dr. Finkel may have given a different answer, but I feel like I did word it fairly well, you know, with the example of the, you know, Hebrew scribes on the river with the Babylonians and their whatever. And he, he understood what I was saying and he's what I, it just doesn't seem that is that this is illogical. This doesn't, I mean, it doesn't follow. It's not negated by literary dependency. In fact, it requires literary dependency. It requires literature to already exist so that they can attack it, right? So I just, I don't know what else to say here besides that I think that I just can't agree with what Dr. Finkel has. I agree with every other point that he made. I mean, let me just go through them real fast, right? I mean, Tradition in the Bible is a digest that takes the essential points of the Mesopotamians. Yep, I agree with that. The Bible takes the Babylonian motif and uses it for its own philosophical perspective. I agree with that. And I also still wonder how these things don't seem to contradict each other, right? Because um, that's almost just saying a polemic. It's just that there's some, there's some up in the airness over the word uses here, right? I mean, over... Over this uses it for its own per own philosophical principle. It uses it, but uh, I think that he just means uses closer to copy, like copy. You know, all the like plagiarism, like it says right right here on the screen here. Um, and I just I can't see that. I just can't see it. But anyways, that's where we're at. Uh, I'm going to be making a video after a while about my own thoughts on the flood. Um, I mean, just outright, I am not a, I don't think that it was a global flood. Um, I don't think it's allegorical or anything. I mean, I think this was an event. I don't know when or anything like that. I don't, I'm not getting that in depth with it. Um, but uh, we will, we will go into a little bit of what I think about the flood at a later date. But anyways, that's what I have to say here. Um, if you have anything that you think that I am not comparing well between these arguments, let me know. Outside of that, have a blessed day. We'll see you in the next one.